Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much, as always, for being here. And thank you very much to everybody who contributed to the Arsenal Vision Podcast's fundraiser, to which I was absolutely delighted to lend my support. It's for the Arsenal Foundation, raising money for Save the Children. And it has raised over £100,000 for that incredibly worthy cause. And it shows just how incredible and generous the Arsenal online community really are. So a big round of applause uh, to all of you for your great support in that. It's uh, it's just fantastic. And I think if you look at the news these days, it's very easy to fall down a, a rabbit hole of despair, which is why I don't really look at the news these days. But I know that when I do uh, perchance across it, it's depressing and it's awful and it makes you feel terrible and it makes you think that people are no good. And look, there are people out there who are absolutely no good at all and fuck them. But this just shows you that there are good people out there willing to come together to help and support and do an amazing thing. So uh, just again, thank you everybody who contributed, however big, however small, it will all go to help a a very, very worthy cause. Uh, It's been a pretty busy week, at least in podcast terms here on the site. We've uh, we've got a brand new Arsenal Women Arsecast. Tim Stillman talking to Julie Fleeting. That's an exclusive interview that you can hear right now. And of course, we had a podcast with Ian Wright on Tuesday. Uh, which went down very, very well. Thank you very much for all the feedback for that. I was delighted to be able to bring it to you, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was a very passionate half hour or so with Ian in which he spoke uh, about the things that are going on at the moment and during this season and everything else. And if you haven't had a chance to listen yet, don't worry, there's no spoilers. This is just to give you a slight flavor of what went down. The one and only Ian Wright. Hello there. Andrew, I love you, man. What's up? <laughs> I love you too. Thank you. It's a good way to start a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> fucking elephant in the room. Fucking, they stopped us because there's a lot of fucking weight on their shoulders. Listen, I don't know what the fuck's going on in your head. If I could just have one fucking chance to have a run in this team, you could be that fucking centre forward there for fucking years. That, that guy's fucking trying, man. On match of the day, where you don't get any fucking time to say anything, you can have a fucking chance of winning games. And it's got to be over my fucking dead body do I not keep this. If they are fucking tight me, I'm going to fucking make sure it's over my dead body I fucking lose this now. No, we've got to say, well, fuck that because that's not going to help us. In this fucking... Fu- I've got fu- I got fucking humiliated. I'm fucking worried, but I'm giving him one more fucking chance because he said, well, fuck that. They just fucking stifled us. Just made me so fucking... Which is still a fucking shame for us. Fucking every inch fucking... Every, that, that, every given Sunday fucking speech with this team. Actually, for fuck's sake. I fucking got to do more. As soon as I see the players' eyes, I fucking go to peace. I could do my fucking speech. I could only do it in argument mode. Gone to, like, fucking tin hat stuff. Top four is fucking... You've got to maybe just say, fuck it. I've got to try something. Andrew. (laughs) <laughs> we both said fuck it at the same time as- uh, it's a pleasure Ian right thank you very much thanks Andrew like I said I love you bro thanks a lot you do great stuff God bless you my thanks to Hente uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that okay uh, they're at Hente underscore AFSC uh, on Twitter who put together that wonderful compilation of Ian Wright on the Arse cast on Tuesday but obviously there was a lot more to the conversation than that uh, the, uh, the exclamation points were just there to emphasize some of the other great stuff that Ian was saying. So if you haven't had a chance to listen already, make sure you get that into your ears this weekend. Right, let's get on with the show. And this week we are doing the statements uh, format podcast in which I get statements, I put them to a guest that they have to either strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree with. We've taken the statements from our wonderful Patreon members uh, from the Discord channel. So thank you guys uh, for posting them in there with me to do the statements statements is tim stillman hello tim hello there we might as well just crack into these because there's loads of them so we'll try and get through as many as we can but before we get into um the ones that have been sent in by the listeners uh, i'm going to give you one to start off with i don't know if you've watched the granite Xhaka video uh, or read the article that he did with players tribune which i thought was quite interesting uh, but just as a, a sort of starting off point here here's the statement granite Xhaka is misunderstood by arsenal fans I disagree. I don't think he's misunderstood. I think he's an acquired taste. I think he's probably quite well understood, and it's just a case of whether you like that sort of thing or not. It's like those... um 
I don't know if you ever worked with someone or been friends with someone who's just really, really blunt. I'm not necessarily saying he's really, really blunt, but yeah. I know I had a friend a um, long time ago uh, who's like super blunt to a fault. And actually, I really, I really got on with him because if he thought I was a cunt, he'd tell me. And, and he did that <laughs> several times and we had it out several times. But I always knew where I stood with him. He was a bit, he was a bit Roy Keane. Yeah. Um, in that respect. So I, I, I don't necessarily think Jack has misunderstood. I think it's just, I think he's a bit of a Marmite type personality. And personally, I think all the better for it. I think he's got um, a lot of character. I think he's very interesting, put it that way. Yeah, I, I agree. I think he's, he is inter- interesting. Uh, I had agree that I would disagree with the statement in that I think people do understand him because he's been here a long time. We understand what kind of a footballer he is. We, under- we understand quite well what kind of a, a man he is and what his attitude is to certain things and how he approaches them. And his mindset is either something that you really like or you really don't like, I think. And it just seems that like the three managers that he's had at Arsenal really like his attitude when it comes to his commitment to work, his dedication, all that kind of stuff, uh, which I thought came across quite well in in that interview. Yeah, I, th- I think the other thing about it as well is he's quite unrepentant. Uh, so when he does make <laughs> one of those mistakes or when he gets sent off for launching into someone two foot, uh, th- this is the kind of the par- the um, the contradiction of Granite Xhaka. Like sometimes he gets sent off for genuinely launching into someone two footed, and he'll blame everyone else for it. And I, and I kind of think that his unrepentedness, even over the captaincy incident and all of that, like he's still not sorry about that. And and I I kind of think he should be, but I respect the fact that he, after all this time, he's still like, no, mm. I, I don't think I was wrong to do that. And, and you can definitely tell that both ways. But then there's this other side where he is genuinely sometimes victimized by referees. So his red cards are a cocktail of genuine stupidity and, um, you know, him being picked on at the same time. But I, I think that's the thing about him. He just like, even when he makes a big mistake, it is both his biggest, his, his like pig headedness mm. is both his biggest strength and his biggest weakness. And it means he doesn't linger on mistakes because he doesn't think they're his fault. Mm. But at the same time, it kind of dooms him to repeat them. And that's, that's why this is all like part of like the Xhaka circuit loop. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's quite a funny bit where he's going like, uh, you know, me getting a yellow card for a tackle. Come on, guys, this is not ballet. We're not doing ballet here. This is football. This is part and parcel of football. And I think he kind of just assumes that this is kind of what you got to do. But you can also modify your game and you can do things slightly differently. Like if you are being refereed in a different way, I'm not saying that's right. It's clearly not right that Granit Xhaka mm. is picked on or picked on is the wrong word, but but certainly never given the benefit of the, uh, the doubt that other players are. Maybe you do have to take that into account in terms of how you play and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, it, it's his world and in his view everyone should like bend to his will (laughs) which again make uh, i i think probably as an elite athlete gives you such an edge but he just doesn't quite have that other five percent that that like self-reflective hmm that you know you know those reddit questions like am i the arsehole yeah yeah yeah. Uh, like he'd he'd make a great candidate for am i the arsehole i launched into someone two-footed and i was sent off am i the arsehole no of course not yeah 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 it's everyone else it's just yeah i think that's just who he is all right here's another one uh this one comes from tally man and he says we should rate the end or we should rate the season at the end of it based on our expectations before it. I slightly disagree with that because I think that the thing is that a season is in a way quite an arbitrary period of time um, and things fluctuate and change throughout the season. So a, a team like Everton, for example, if Everton finish, if Everton, Lord forbid, come to the Emirates on the final day, they win and they stay up. They will celebrate the hell out of that yeah. if they finish seventeenth. That is not what Everton's expectations were, but think like shit changes during the season. Yeah. So I do think it's fine. Like I don't think you have to update your expectations every summer. Um, I, I, but I see where the question's coming from. I do think you know there is an element. Let's say Arsenal finish fifth this year or six, it would kind of feel disappointing from here. Whereas in August, you'd think, no, that's, that's, that's roughly like, yeah, that feels like a, mm. a decent trajectory. So like the journey does matter, but the journey mattering 
is why I think it's okay to update your expectations. Like there are loads of teams who've come up in the Premier League and probably uh, like Leeds last season, not mm. this season, probably expectations stay up. But like once you're up in 10th or 11th place, then no, okay, our expectation is to stay around about here. Like we're not going to be happy with 17th from here. So yeah. I, I slightly disagree uh, with that. Yeah, I would too. I mean, it's it's the context of the season is is what brings you up, what brings you down, and sends you sort of around the twist and around the bend, you know. Because you know, I think if you had said um, after the first three games of the season that we would be sitting in fourth with games in hand with ten or eleven games to go, you'd say, "Fuck, I'll bite your hand off for that." Absolutely, I would. But now you're kind of going, "I wish we could go back in time and and have those games in hand again," because from here it would feel disappointing not to finish in the top four, and that's just that's just part of it. It's like being like. I don't know, 4 nil up at Newcastle. And you're thinking, yeah. well, this is going to be great. And then by the end of the game, you're like, oh, hang on a minute. My expectations have changed or things have changed here. Yeah, the, the most extreme example of, the, of this, uh, possibly apart from that, is if you'd offered a Leicester City fan second or third in early April 2016, like mm. you offer a Leicester fan that in like August 2015, like, Mike. God, what an over like what an yeah. overachievement that would be. But once you're once you're at the top and you're on the cusp, like you know, you update your mm. priors. I, I appreciate that's quite an extreme example. And Arsenal are uh, you know, Arsenal are teetering in that about where we think they should be. Yeah, um, kind of area. So I, you know, maybe that's a slightly facetious example. No, I know what you mean though, because like they they just about avoided relegation the season before, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're champions at the end of the next season, which is just like a crazy thing. But yeah, uh, just on the same sort of um, theme, this one comes from Saka manager, but not Mikel, and they say getting Europa League instead of Champions League is the right step for this squad. Um, I slightly disagree. Um, I ultimately, I don't think the first eleven is going to change an awful lot. I think you know, hopefully, central midfielder, striker. But really, the big upgrade happened last summer. Like we bought four starters last summer, and and I don't think we can expect that kind of turnover again for for seven. Not in the starting lineup for several years. I think now it's more going to be about filling those key positions and then thickening the squad out a little bit. Um, but n no, not really. Just because I th I think um, I see a lot of this kind of, oh, Arsenal aren't ready for the Champions League. And I, I kind of think it's bollocks. I would back us to get through the group stage. I really would. Um, and ultimately, if we don't, I think at the very least, we'd finish third in the group and go through to the Europa League knockouts anyway. Mm. But like, maybe that's the right step. Maybe going into the group stage, finishing third, and then actually going into the competition, we stand a chance of winning. I don't know. But I, I don't think, like, I think when people watch games like Atleti, Man City and Real Madrid, Chelsea, yeah, we're not at that level yet. But that's not the only level in the Champions League. We're mm. not just talking about winning it. Like, I, I think we'd be fine in the group stage. I, I think that most, maybe every team in the top half of the Premier League at the moment, given the financial supremacy of the league, would at the very least make a very good crack of getting out of a group. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I slightly disagree with that. Yeah, I would too. I would too. I think it would be a good step forward. I think it would be a confidence boost. It would be um, a financial platform. It would be an achievement for this young team um, to get there. And, you know, the challenge then is, okay, we've done it once. Can we do it again? Can we do it again? And consistency is the thing which separates good teams from – you know, mediocre teams. That is the reality. And if you can then produce consistent league finishes, which keep you in the top four, which keep you in the Champions League, uh, you know, then you're going places. And I think you can you can build from there. Like, you're never going to build a title-winning team unless you can build a team that's capable of staying in the top four season after season. Yeah, and I think the reality is of this kind of top four chase, as it were, for the next few seasons, I think it's very unlikely that even if Arsenal make it this season, I think it's very unlikely we'll see what we saw in that mid-Wenger period where we just do it every year. I think the competition is such, unfortunately, between like us and Spurs in particular, is that it's going to go back to maybe how it was between us and Spurs, albeit we were on we were on the good end of that more often than not, mm. but not by much. 
and maybe there's a little bit of karmic retribution happening for that at the moment. But I think the reality is, even if we got in next this year, we shouldn't take for granted. Like over the next five years, I would imagine that Arsenal will get in a couple of times. Maybe Spurs will get in a couple of times. United will get in a couple. Like I just think that fourth place might be on rotation um, mm. for a few years. So I say get it as often as you can, quite frankly. Yeah, because United, if they've got uh, a new manager next season, are probably going to be a different beast. And maybe if they can sort some of the executive issues out at their club and, and put in place a plan, we know they've got the infrastructure and the firepower and the financial firepower to, to build a proper team rather than do what they've been doing over the last couple of years, which is sort of like... Uh, what Arsenal did, you know, trying all the quick fixes and, and all that kind of stuff. So if they get back in there, I mean, do you see that top three is slightly immutable for the foreseeable future? Is Chelsea in some kind of peril? Are they going to struggle a bit um, with the ownership issues? Chelsea are the most interesting i think at the moment but just because we don't know at the moment what their new owners are going to be like i really struggle to believe that their new owners are just going to be chucking away a hundred million a season and writing it off so in some respects they'll be weakened i also think that chelsea i don't think chelsea have ever been smart with their money i think what chelsea have always done is just throw money at players and then the owner says to the manager get on with it mm. and if you don't crack it in six months you're gone and uh, I, I know like everyone says well it works for them they win loads of stuff but I think that you look at City City that's that's money with brains and that's mm. why they're in the title race and usually winning it every single year rather than doing what Chelsea are doing, which is some years in the title race, some years we're like fifth, some years 10th. Mm. We usually pick up a trophy somewhere. And of course, like they've been successful, but I think they've thrown away a lot of their money because the owner they had doesn't care about his money. That is not yeah. what he's in it for. It's, um, I won't say anything that invites legal trouble, but yeah, there really. are reasons he's willing <laughs> to throw away that money every year that that's not going to be their new ownership model i don't think their new owners are going to be penny pinchers though and they've got plenty to work with so i think you know yeah i don't think they'll fall out of contention but it would just be a readjustment for them it's such an interesting thing to think about now because you often have those um that point of view or or people will say well look chelsea are utterly ruthless when a manager doesn't do something, they just get rid of him. They bring in another manager. They keep winning. They keep winning. They keep winning. But it's almost in spite of that uh, approach to managers and head coaches that they win. Um, yep. In spite of it, it sounds wrong. But but it, it's a demonstration that if you do just throw enough money, you're going to win out because quality really counts at, at that end of the table. Yeah, and, and that's why Chelsea win lots of cups, but maybe not as many league titles as they should, because, yeah, eventually mm. that, that build-up of quality will... And, and that's I guess that's my fear about Man United, because as, as stupid as they are, Arsenal was stupid for a long time, and look at how much... Um, I don't know if I should say this now, because there's maybe question marks over our improvement. Look at how much we improved on the back of one summer window. Mm. Like, we bought four starters for, you know, a, a fair whack of money and a couple of squad players. And those four starters, I'd say, have all been successful. Um, maybe question marks over, you know, Lukonga and Tavares at this point. But mm. Ben White, Ramsdale, Tommy Asu, Erdegaard, success, all four. I think that's that's relatively uncontroversial to say. Yeah. That is well within Manchester United's grasp. Like, you can, what that shows you is you can change a lot in one transfer window if... I think if you're a, in a space like Arsenal were, like Manchester United are, where it's a bit like, look, we need quite a lot here. We need to pull this down. And like like the, the, the ceiling's quite low at mm. the moment. Um, yeah. And, and I, like, I think if Man U had one good summer like that, then, you know, it, it could be very different. Yeah, particularly when you consider that they're bringing in uh, Eric Ten Hag from, from Ajax and Ralph Ranić is there, who's probably better as like a sporting director, consulting kind of guy rather than the guy who's going to manage the team week in, week out. So on the basis that they would have that level of experience um, going in at that club, it sort of makes our summer of, of 2021 even more 
surprising, astonishing, remarkable. Mm. I don't know what word you want to use, but I'm not sure there was. In fact, I know there wasn't the faith in the people making the decisions at the football club last summer that people went, well, if they're going to bring in six players, I'm going to trust their judgment on these and and they're going to be good. There was a lot of hand-wringing over a number of the signings who've turned out to be good this season and hopefully will be better next season as well. Um, so I think that that's that's a, an aspect of this that we don't really consider too much, that, that the faith we had in them to do that back then was was not really there. No, exactly. And, and United are another club who, both on the pitch and behind the scenes, they're in the throw enough at it and let's see yeah. what happens kind of thing. And, yeah. and Arsenal were in that too as well. Arsenal were in that. I mean, maybe I'd be more generous to Arsenal and call it trial and error. Um, in terms of what they were doing behind the scenes. And I think United have fallen into that. But United spending power, like they're doing it, Mm. you know, from a financial aspect, they're doing it at a higher level than Arsenal. And so you'd have to think that the results would be like, let's say Arsenal finish three places higher in the league. Let's, Let's say we finish fifth from eighth last year. Like if you translate that to United, look, they're not going to go up three places, um, I don't think. I don't think they'll catch Liverpool and City in a summer, um, but they could catch Chelsea in a summer, I think. Mm. Andrew H111 says, Nuno Tavares is being misused as a more defensive left-back and is suffering as a result. I think I slightly disagree with that just because, I mean, he's not being used. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's one aspect of it, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, not just, sorry, that was a bit pithy. Like, um, obviously he was used against Crystal Palace, but that was the first game he'd started in months, really. Mm. Um, and and I don't think, I think when he was in with Tommy Yasu, I don't think that's how it was. Maybe it was a little bit like that at Palace, to be honest with you, um, in the away end at Selhurst Park. Um, I'll be kind and say you can't exactly see the tactical intricacies of the game. Um, you get a smashing view of the back of someone's head. <laughs> um, but so I, I, I don't have like a big opinion on exactly how that um, that defensive line was formatted, particularly because they're at the other end um, mm. in the first half. So I, I, m- maybe it's true of that game. Maybe we tried to slot him in because like Tierney can do that, right? We know he can because yeah. he's tucked in and played centre back in a back three. It, it's not probably what he likes doing, but he'll do it. Um, and, and, and yeah, m- maybe that is, maybe the balance of Cedric and Tavares is not right. Um, in fact, I'd say that's, that it's almost certainly not right. Um, but I, d- I don't really see what we can do about that until Tommy Asu comes back. And ultimately, you know, when you play at this level of football, sometimes you've just got to do things that, that aren't your favorite things to do. Um, and to be fair, there's uh, the, the captain's a good 10 years older than Nuno Tavares and he won't do things that he doesn't like doing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I slightly disagree. I, I see it, there's probably some truth in it, but I slightly disagree. Yeah, I mean, I think the point is that he's probably better in the attacking third than uh, the defensive third. But if you are ostensibly a left back, I think you need to be able to do that job better than he's done it in in the last yeah. uh, couple of days uh, or couple of weeks anyway. Uh, there was one here which I thought was quite uh, associated with this one. Yes, it comes from Game Nenny, who says, all the players Ar- uh, Arteta distrusts seem to be of questionable quality. Um, I, again, I slightly disagree, which is not to disagree necessarily with Arteta's assessment, but so I like personally, I, and, and I know, um, not everyone thinks this, least of all yourself, but I, I, I think Gwendozi is quality. Um, I, I, like, I don't think he's like a phenomenon or anything. I think he's really good. Like, I don't think there are many midfielders that age, um, like playing like that really. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying he's a generational talent, but I think he's mm. good. I think he'd be useful to Arsenal at the moment. When you're looking at that left eight space, I think Gwendozi could play that. In fact, I think that's largely what he was playing more or less under Emery. So, I, I, and I don't, I don't necessarily think um, there's a there's a quality issue there. Do you um, think in Arteta's do, mind? Do you think that? I mean, I, personally, 
uh, we might differ a bit on the player. I mean, I think he he had some uh, some talent for sure, just maybe not quite uh, at the level that some people said. But I don't think it was necessarily an ability issue no, when it comes to Mikel Arteta. And I think in some cases, like clearly to play football at this level, you have to have a level of talent and ability and, and everything else. But I think in the instance of this one, when we talk about players that Arteta distrusts, I think more about, let's say, Tavares, where there was a clear show of mistrust, if you like, or lack of faith in him for, um, you know, for the Brighton game. Similarly, Nicolas Pepe. I don't think he necessarily trusts him to do what he wants a player in that position to do. Um yeah. Whereas I think with Genduzi, there were off-field issues that precipitated his departure, which had nothing really to do with his ability as a player. Albeit, if he was a generational talent, you're probably a bit more inclined to um, put up with nonsense, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, and and also there there are some like squad players that that Arteta does trust, like Holding. Um, he clearly likes and trusts Rob Holding. I think he's come round to Cedric. Um, as well, I don't necessarily think that he loved and appreciated Cedric, uh, you know, prior to this kind of period. But that hasn't had much choice, to be honest. No, no, no. But like he, he kind of did study some other alternatives, I think, mm. early on. Whereas now it's just like, okay, Cedric goes in at right back when Tommy Asu's not there, and and I think he's more comfortable with that choice. Like, like obviously, 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 the number one reason a manager won't trust the player is is down to quality, mm. maybe even instruction. And 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 look, those kind of things go together because someone like Pepe, for example. I mean, the boy, his feet are superb, um, but his I, I, I don't really see much evidence of a football brain there sometimes. Um, like when you look at that corner in stoppage time <laughs> against Brighton yeah. or the concession of the free kick against Aston Villa also in stoppage time. And you just think, uh, you know that song from Wizard of Oz, the Scarecrow song, If I Only Had a Brain? Yeah. I, like sometimes I sit there and hum that to myself, <laughs> but like super talent. But I completely understand why Arteta doesn't trust him to start him. I, I don't really think I would mm. either. Um, so like, like, I think there is an element of truth, but at the same time, I do think the quote unquote non-negotiables matter to Arteta. And I, and I do think that sometimes those are the things that, that makes him not or leads him not to trust players. But then like, I guess to finish another example is Elneny. Elneny is a guy he likes. He said he liked, mm. um, he used him a lot this season, not used him at all. And I think that's the right way to go. He's kind of gone, right. You're not staying with us anyway. Um, Lekonga is we'd rather put the minutes into Lekonga and that makes absolute sense and I don't think that's because Arteta thinks Lekonga is a better player than Elneny in fact I think if Arsenal were playing a cup final tomorrow I, I wouldn't mind betting that Elneny might start it um, but it's it's a decision based on right this is our guy we, we need to raise his ceiling. We know yeah. where is and we know he's going. So th- there are some of those things that come into it as well, I'm sure. Yeah, look, uh, it, it's like what I was saying during the week when it comes to the Tavares thing. Like we look at a player who was taken off against Nottingham Forest, had a, the odd substitute appearance and then got taken off against Crystal Palace and people go, well, he hasn't really had chances or whatever. But this is a guy that the manager sees and the coaching staff see every single day at London Colney. And this is a major part in how they make decisions. It's not just what they do in games. You know, they could prepare well, they could train well, they could work hard. But if you go out on the pitch and don't follow the instructions that you're given, um, it's going to put the back up of any manager or any coach. You know, there was, um, wasn't there a game when Martinelli got taken off? Yeah, Man United, I think, yeah. last year. And he wasn't playing badly. Wasn't playing particularly badly, but I think the explanation afterwards was he wasn't doing what we wanted the player in that position to do. And that's... I guess informs how how the manager makes uh, makes decisions. Um, David Baratunk says rushing Tommy Yasu back is the greatest error of the season. Um, I yeah probably agree. Um, it's it's 
but I, I do have some sympathy because I'm like, I'm not a medical expert. And as far as I know, sometimes this stuff just happens. Um, and with all the medical expertise in the world, someone can look ready, be ready, pass all the tests, all the heart rate tests, all the bleep tests, mm. you know, have their massage and everything. And, and you know, the, and, and then the game starts and no. Mm. Um, that, like, I think with the best will in the world, that can happen. It shouldn't happen often if your medical staff are doing their jobs. And I don't think it has happened that often. Maybe you point to Thomas Party last season. Um, that That's not really happened to him this season, although it remains to be seen. Maybe if he makes an appearance on Saturday yeah. <laughs> out of the blue, then maybe that is a bit of a Hail Mary. But I mean, it, like in hindsight, yes. And I do think... You know, we're talking about a lot about the absences of Tierney and Party at the moment. I mean, we've been playing without Tommy Asu for a couple of months and he's a big player. And like, don't get me wrong, you shouldn't like losing your right back shouldn't derail your season. And it didn't. It didn't. But I do think like we still played well and got good results in that time. But like, it's it's the confluence, right? It's oh, now we've lost yeah. our right back and our left back and our defensive midfielder. And it's like we could cope with one of those and Cedric's an imperfect replacement, but decent squad player. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have huge problems uh, with Cedric per se. Um, but, but at the same time, it's that it's those three together. But, but yeah, I, I do think that the loss of Tommy Asu, it's, it's going to be more felt now, I think, mm. than perhaps it was in February and March. Yeah, I mean, this was the period where I was really looking for him to come back. Um, and we did, you know, we did win games and we have won games. I mean, you'll remember this better than me because you remember details and things with much greater detail. But um, the 2007 2008 season, everyone thought about the Eduardo injury, but there was also an injury to Flamini. And if I'm right, there was an injury to Bakary Sanya, which kept mm -hmm. him out, which sort of added into that, that funk we got ourselves into. Was it ski? Yeah. You know, so yeah, the the cumulative impact of of the injuries can be something. Hopefully, we get him back because he's been uh, a really, really good signing. Carrie says, while we should definitely make a signing in this position, regardless, Saka is a better candidate than Smith Rowe to play next to Odegaard in the left eight position. I can't agree yet. So I'll say slightly disagree because I don't think we've seen it enough. Um, I, I thought Smith Rowe uh, was a really good candidate for the left eight role. Uh, uh, to be honest, I think he's got fitness issues, which might be governing, yeah. might have governed his Brighton performance. I, I still think he's a decent candidate for that. Not ideal, but decent. I must admit, about this time two years ago, I speculated that that's what Saka would end up as, as that kind of... Um, left-sided midfielder in a midfield three, maybe a bit like uh, like someone like Clarence Seydorf or someone like that, like a left-footed version. Mm. Just that that player who just plays in that lane, really. Um, so I, I do... I think Saka can play pretty much anywhere because I think he's just one of those players. I think yeah. he's that good. I think if he played there, he'd be great. Um, you know, whether, whether he'd be as good as he's been on the right... I, I didn't really think he'd make a right winger, to be honest. The first couple of times I saw it, I thought, mm, no, I don't like him there. And then all of a sudden, bang, there mm. it is. And and I think that's because he's such an intelligent guy. Like, he's incredibly clever, both, both like, I think his academic um, intelligence and his football intelligence all feed into each other. Like, you know, I think it's been said before about his exam results and stuff like that, even though like, he wasn't at school, basically. Yeah. And yet he was still just like turning out A-stars. I think he's just one of those annoying people that's probably good at everything. Um, <laughs> he'd probably be a professional cricketer as well if he wanted and, you know, th those irritating people. So I, 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 th I think he'd do it just fine. Um, but that's speculative at the moment because we haven't really seen enough of him. And I have to say... I just love him so much on that right-hand side. I, I do think at this moment it's his optimum position. 
I agree with that. I would also disagree with that contention that he's a better candidate to play alongside Martin Odegaard. I just don't know about the balance of two left-footed players in those positions, you know? Yeah. Uh, particularly if, if well, I mean, I guess we've got it with Shaka and Odegaard as well when when yeah. Shaka plays in that position too. So maybe I'm just overthinking this. I, I, I think you're right in that he is capable of playing pretty much anywhere. Um, you could play anywhere across that uh, front three, if not necessarily a, a, a striker. And I think he could play in midfield too, certainly as an eight, not necessarily as a, a deeper lying midfielder, uh, but I think he could. So maybe uh, maybe I'll have to um, agree with that. I've talked myself into agreeing with it, having started out <laughs> disagreeing. So there you I, go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't whinge if I saw it. <laughs> I really wouldn't. No. Yeah. Um, while we're on Smith Row, we don't talk about Nuno, says... We will see Smithrow tried as a false nine again before we see Martinelli deployed as a striker. Ooh, that's really interesting. God, I don't know. Um, just for the sake of variance, because I've disagreed with a lot of people, I'll say agree. I I do think there's something in that. I do think that he just like, and, and understandably, I do think certainly at the moment the left is Martinelli's best position that kind of I think he's doing that position better than Aubameyang did um like overall technically he's he's not quite scoring the same amount of goals but mm. I think overall his contribution from the left is superior to Aubameyang's in everything other than goal scoring albeit Martinelli can do that and I think he will develop to that level anyway and I know the player himself has said that's his favorite position mm. I, I I think he'd be a good striker uh, that's certainly if I were picking the team on Saturday that's um that's who I'd have through the middle but I do think there's something in that I I don't necessarily think we've seen the end of um Smith Rowe as a false nine my, my actual prediction is that Inketia starts on Saturday um at Southampton so I I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced we'll see either of them unless perhaps Inketia plays a couple of games and bombs out and yeah. then or there's an injury or something. But yeah, I, I think I probably agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would tend to agree with that too. I mean, it depends on Smith Rowe's fitness as well, because like you, I think he's feeling something. I think we had a, we had one about, uh, I missed it. I apologize uh, to the person uh, on the discord, but they basically said something about, you know, Smith Rowe hasn't been the same since he got that first bout of COVID or illness or whatever it was. And I think that might well be something to that on top of, I think probably some aches and strains um, that he's carrying, having, having sort of, there was that really interesting story um, during the season about how he's changed the way that he eats and the club are now, you know, giving him a, a uh, chef or a personal chef or whatever it is so he can eat proper food rather than sort of Nando's and chips every night of the week, which isn't, you know, I'm sure it's delicious for the people who like Nando's, the most overrated chicken in the world. Um, but, you know, for a professional athlete, you've got to look after yourself a bit different. I just wonder if, you know, that on top of, in inverted commas, growing pains, you know, when you go from 18 to 21, 22, there's a lot happens to you physically and all the football he's been asked to play since being catapulted into the team on, on December 26th, uh, back into, in 2020, like, I'm pretty sure he's carrying something. Um, yeah. And, and he's got a history there as well, right? We talk about growing yeah. pains. I mean, he, he was out with a hip injury, um, necessarily through my own medical exploits i've become something of an expert on hip injuries <laughs> because i've got like a pretty permanent one myself and it's it's a bugger you don't you don't realize how important your mm. hips are until one of them gives out because they're like they're load bearing like, load bearing walls they are they are so like your hamstrings your calves your pelvis your back your shoulders like Trust me, I, I'm quite a bit older than Smith Rowe, unfortunately, but trust me, it all fucking hurts. Um, <laughs> and you spend a lot of money on mattresses. Um, so, like, to get that, you know, when he was, what, 19 mm. or so? Like, yeah, that's... And, you know, like, we saw what happened maybe. Like, I, I'm, I'm positive that that happening early in his career is better than later because we saw like Freddie Lundberg got a similar kind of thing with his hip right mm. and I don't think we ever quite saw the same Freddie Jungberg after that good still really mm. good like it wasn't an enormous problem 
But I don't think we ever saw him quite the same. I think Smith Rowe probably encountered that young enough that it won't be a massive long term problem. But mm. you know, if things like like your hamstring shorten, you know, and that makes them tighten up a little bit more. And look, he's got access to like better <laughs> better care <laughs> than I do. But you know, th- those things come into it. And sure. um, yeah, I I think there's there's certainly a bit of that going on. Uh, Ash Richards um, says, uh, he, he, he phrased it as a question, but I'll just uh, reverse it a little bit. It is wrong to wish injury on Son and Kane. I'll strongly disagree. Like, <laughs> like look, I'm not necessarily going to wish like an ACL or anything. Like, it, it's wrong to do that. I would say that. But look, what's the threshold for injury wishing? Like, is it, you know, a sprain? I mean, out for the season, like at this stage, what's that, five weeks? Like, look, I'm, 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 maybe I'm a bad person, okay? But if one, if, if one or both of them got a grade two hamstring, look, I'm not going to, let's none of us pretend that however we, whatever our public face is, you know, and we might even tweet something like, oh, I'd never wish, like, let's not <laughs> pretend. What would, like, just be, like, no no one has to say this out loud or to anyone they like and respect, but just internalise for a second. Let's say that tweet pops up on your timeline today that Sun and Kane somehow, I don't know, maybe they were sprinting, having a race in training, and both of their hamstrings went, and it was, like, grade two, they're out for eight weeks. Like, what would your initial emotional reaction be to that I, news? I would buy a cake. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and probably uh, just sit there and eat the cake and and just bask in the happiness of that. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm. Look, there's an element where it goes a bit too far online, and this idea that you kind of have to be magnanimous or whatever, a uh, good sport, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I get it to an extent, but there's part of me that just wants misery inflicted oh, yeah. upon every other team and every other player that isn't Arsenal. And I make no apologies for that. Like like you, I don't mean permanent disability. I don't want to see them, you know, oh, I'm afraid we're going to have to amputate your leg, Mr. Kane. I'm sorry about that. Like, I'm not saying I want it to go that far, but, you know, uh, six months, nine, whatever. I'm not going to cry any tears. I'm not going to pretend yeah. I will. I, I'd probably run down to the bottom of the garden and do my own hamstring yeah. in the process. Not Celebrate. least because I'd probably be, my muscles would probably be very dehydrated from the alcohol intake yeah. uh, uh, that preceded that. And, you know, I'd probably, in a moment of solidarity, that would be my penance. I would, let's get James to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's get James, get drunk, James. Run down to the bottom of your garden if you have one, down your street. And when your hamstrings go, you'll be like a human voodoo doll for Son and Kane. All right. That's your challenge for the weekend. Yes, I'm sure he will take that on with gusto because there's nothing he likes more than, than picking up injuries in the, in the, uh, in the pursuit of goodness uh, for Arsenal. Okay, here is one from, oh, where is it gone here? Lowy133. He says, XG is a load of bollocks. Um, no, disagree. Um, I, you know, I, I, it depends what you want to use it for. Like the thing is, I think the value of it. So I, I don't think that I think like if I haven't seen a game, then I think obviously other than like looking at the score and I see the score, like the quit, if you told me like how best to absorb this game in three seconds in an image, like an extra, like Michael Cayley's like XG map kind of thing. That now, obviously, there's things about like you need to dig down a bit into that, like running XG and did they, you know, is the XG on this game like three three because one team went five nil up and then just stopped playing and the other team just kept pepper. You know, mm. there, there's some context around it. Where I think XG is really really valuable is over like a, a medium kind of period of time. And and you see this, I think I think there are really, really good pieces like in the analytics community and things like that. Like it, it is genuinely, I think, a really good predictor. Like just go back to the beginning of Unai Emery's reign when things results wise look pretty good. Mm. Now I was watching them and I was thinking, I don't know that they're this good. And then like members of um, you know, the analytics community, I'm making them sound like um some kind of 
like cult Ill- Illuminati, <laughs> which I don't mean. Our analytics um, overlords, I think, is the expression yeah. you want to use, Tim. I, I for one, welcome our <laughs> analytics overlords. Um, but they were writing stuff saying this isn't going to last. This isn't going to last unless some of this, like you know, and and all it all basically XG is is that impression you get when you watch a game of kind of what the score should have been, which all of us more or less have innately anyway. Mm. Um, and I think that, and, and look, sometimes, like I say, an, an individual game is perhaps not always the best measure, usually a decent one, but not always. But over a long period of time, I think your XG tells you things and you can kind of start to say, mm, we've been overperforming our XG for like two months now. Like this is going to come back on us. And, and I, again, I'll give you another example. Like Arsenal women beginning of the season flew out of the traps, absolutely flew out. Yeah, but they were well above their XG for a little while, and you're like, hmm. And then, sure enough, December and January, they hit a bit of a sticky patch, and it was almost like it's it's just it's almost like the gambler's fallacy of luck, right? It's just kind of luck catching up on you. So, I I I no, I disagree. I, I think I think XG. I think as someone like me who's not great with data, it's a really simple kind of tool maybe it's used too simply by by some people sometimes maybe myself included but no i i i I like it as a piece of data which is not to say i bow down at an altar and worship it and base all of my opinions on it you haven't got a great big xg tattoo across (laughs) your chest no (laughs) nothing like that not yet not Not yet yet. no yeah you get there look i think i think the the uh, the use of data and analytics in in football has has become really really interesting um, and I think if you can combine your eyes and data, you're rounding out what you experience from a game, you know, because there are times I know I've watched games and I've gone and looked at the stats, particularly when it comes to individual player performances and you go, Jesus, that guy couldn't fucking pass the ball tonight. And you realize that your perception of that is based on, let's say two or three early miscued passes. And you're thinking he's having a fucking shocker here. And then you go back and you look and you realize, oh, he passed 75 out of 81 passes, you know, 96% pass completion rate. And you're like, Oh, you know, there are times where it sort of helps you not understand, but it sort of helps you contextualize what you've seen. Yeah, and I'll give you an analogy here. I can't remember who it was. There was a philosopher, maybe Spinoza or someone like that, who basically there's always this argument about whether humans have like innate ability to understand like numbers and language or whether they start, I think the phrase is tabula rasa, clean slate. And there was a philosopher who argued that basically we are born with innate mathematical understanding and that the, the kind of the rationale he used is if I draw two lines... Like, unless they're really, really close, you can see which one is longer than the other with your eyes without using a ruler. Um, and, and to me, XG is just the ruler. Not, not the ruler. As, again, I, 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 <laughs> I don't mean like the overlord that we should all pray to every day. You night. mean a 30 in, centimeter long piece of plastic or wood exactly, that you used yes. to use to, you know, crack people on the arse when you're in school. Rashers. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. That is the uh, the key use of a of a ruler. Uh, let's get a few uh, through a few more just before we go. Um, Heng Henkyo says uh, because of Kieran Tierney's injuries every season, Arsenal need to look for a new starting left back. I I'd say slightly disagree, but I kind of agree as well. Basically, right. We've kind of like Tavares is going to be a goner, isn't he? Really, so that so. position's going to have to be addressed, and and I think that basically the next time they buy a left back, it's going to have to be someone that's like, look, we're going to have to be able to trust the, particularly if we're in Europe uh, to any degree. Um, this is going to have to like I, I got the Tavares signing. I always viewed the Tavares signing as we've got important shit to do this summer. We cannot spend the whole summer ch- like doing a mm. Dick Law and chasing like backup left backs around. L- you know, it always had the the air of a could be Stepanovs, could be Torre, could mm. be Armory Bischoff. You know, a bit of a hail mary. There's some talent there, probably something to work with. And he's not going to be first choice. He's not expensive. He's young, so he'd probably be easy to get rid of. 
so I understood it. Mm. The next left back signing can't be that. The next left back signing, I think, has to be someone relatively serious, I think. So not necessarily a replacement, certainly someone who can compete with. And, you know, we have to face the reality that this is what Tierney's career has showed us to this point. And we do, I think, have to be more prepared for that eventuality. Mm. I I don't think we can replace him because we gave him the contract as well. Um, which is an expression of faith on him in yeah. him that I don't think you can reverse on just yet. But I'd say the next left back we sign has to be like more towards starting quality. Yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah, like you say, with, with Nuno, it's a bit of a, a gamble. Like he's a young player um, who was slightly on the outs at his club and we took a chance and so far it doesn't appear to have worked and whether it does in the future remains to be seen but I do wonder if they might go for a similar style or a similar age profile of player but perhaps yeah. somebody who they've had a bit more time to to do the due diligence on if who that was, makes sense um, who was the Scottish guy we were supposed to be after last summer what from was Hibs guy what was his Hibs? name Keig or something uh, let me just have a look here like, I, I wonder if that's something they'll revisit. I've got Josh, no idea. Josh Doig. Doig. Or that's Doig. It. Yeah. I think he's a bit of a... If I'm right, I'll just look him up here and see. Um, I think he's a bit of a... Oh, he doesn't have his height here. I think he's tall. I think he's, there's an element of, like, Tommy Asu style to right. him. Um, I could be wrong on this, um, but I can't find... I'll just see if I can find his height. Because uh, the internet is full of weird things like that. 189, 1.89 meters, which is about what, 6'2, 6'2 and a half? Yeah. yeah. So he's that kind of a profile of player, but whether or not um, we go back in for him uh, remains to be seen. Um, right. What's this now says uh, this summer is a sliding doors moment for transfers. If we don't get what we need to push into the top four, then this version of the project and key members of our current group of exciting players will move on. Um, I, I think I maybe somewhat agree. I, I do, yeah, I do think it's a key summer. The, the big reason it's a key summer is because of the striker issue, right? That's that's like mm. even like the central midfielder. I think Jack has done well enough in that left eight role that it's not we're not carrying timber there. It's just like mm. maybe we get someone who for whom that's a more comfortable role. Um, but the striker just means so much. It it really, really does. It's probably the most important signing that Arteta will make at Arsenal, however long he's here for. I think so much hinges on it. It is um, mad, isn't it, to think that he's been here since 2019. He's had, what, five, six windows now at this point? And the, the only forward, uh, in inverted commas, that he's brought into the club is Willian, and that's mm. you know I don't want to go over all that again because um, you know I've got to yeah, like that's... reveal my Willian is a twat tattoos and all that kind of stuff. But you know what I mean. In in like two and a half, he hasn't necessarily had to, but nor has he. And this is where I think this summer becomes really really interesting because we've speculated like on does he want. Um, like a hybrid Lacazette Aubameyang kind of striker. He wants the guy who can drop deep, but who can spin, who can get back in the box, who can link up play, but who can also cut in from the left and who's a great finisher and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, who the fuck is that? Who is that? Viv- like even he wants Vivian Miedema. That's who he wants. I'll tell you that for nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. We've got to find that player out there. You know who that is. And and who uh, how available they are to us this summer is going to be absolutely fascinating. I think. Yeah, and the thing is, what when you look at it, what did this, not this team, that t- maybe the team before the the Emery like back end Wenger mm. Emery first half of Arteta, the, the biggest failure in that project was the fact that Pepe, Aubameyang, and Lacazette can't play together. Mm. None of those are bad players by any means. And there's a reason we paid the money we did for them. But the the old, all of the other pieces have been fairly movable. Like we've gone from David Luiz to Ben White, you know, and that's been that's been fairly decent. And you know, we brought Thomas Partey in, great. Um, moved on from Özil and got Erdegaard, great. But like, 
the the the, the failure of since like that kind of you know because c- essentially in 2016 right we were looking at that kind of rebuild and it started with Jaka Mustafi and Perez and it's like okay <sighs> this hasn't got off to a good start but really that they weren't like they weren't terminal for the project it was the fact that we spent like what 170 million on that front three and not even two of them can play together really let alone three yeah. and that, that's been the central failure of of the project and so now um you know we've got sack of their lock we know we've got that brilliant yeah um but like and you know we've got martinelli there in in whatever position he plays brilliant but like that third piece and we've got Smith Rowe who can play there. Like, like we've got mm. we've got better pieces around it, but that like that arrowhead piece now, and and we've got them largely for free, by the way. Yeah. Um, other than like Martinelli, who we spent pennies on, but so but that arrowhead point that's that's going to define whether this Arteta project, um, wh- whether it falls or whether mm. it rises, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see what happens. Um, we had a lot of sort of statements about Arteta's future and top six and all that kind of stuff, and I'm just sort of loath to go there. And it's not that I don't appreciate the, the conversation or anything like that, and I'm sure it's a conversation that um, we will have down the line a bit, but I don't necessarily want to go into those now because I'm trying to keep my um, my water bottle half full here. Um, we'll do a couple more just to finish. Fortune143 says, there is no consistency in officiating nowadays at all. Look at the Atletico City match last night. How is what Savage did to Foden not classed as violent conduct. Referees are more concerned with saving face over properly officiating a game of football or managing player safety. I um, I slightly disagree. I think, um, I think uh, consistency in officiating is both impossible and not even desirable because the, w- the way the rules are are open to interpretation. That's the kind of game football is. In the Premier League, I'd argue it's very consistent, and I think that's a problem um, because there's no diversity. Bad. Do you mean yeah, consistent yeah. or the quality, or, do, or well, diversity in terms of the, uh, yeah, the the makeup, the makeup of, of the, the referee referees? Pool. There's no racial diversity at no. all. There's very little gender diversity, and. Basically, all of the referees, from what I can see, they, they all have like the same local pub. They all come mm. from like the same area of the country, and and I think that leads to a lack of diversity in decision making and the decisions, and 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 I think that's a problem. So not only do I think that, I think that the Premier League has got consistency, but in a, and I think that's undesirable, and I think that illustrates why consistency is kind of undesirable. I mm. think you need to have, and, and I think you need to let referees manage the temperature of a game. Like every game is different. And I think some games you have to go, mm, all right, I'm not going to give him a yellow card there. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you see a yellow card and it's just making an example. Yeah. Like if there's been lots of rotational fouling or something, it's like, look, mate, to be honest, your offence wasn't any different to the five that came before you, but I'm fed up with all of you now, so you're getting it kind mm. of thing. And that's not consistent, but it's right. That is how you should referee a game. Mm. So I'd say I, 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 I kind of agree and disagree. I don't think it should be. It shouldn't be wildly inconsistent. I don't think it should be consistent. I think we've got consistency in the Premier League, and it's shit. Yeah, it is consistently bad. Is Uriah Rennie the last black referee? I I believe so, yes. Wow. Wow. I mean, that really does a say a lot, doesn't it? Um, I know they are launching a, a an, what, an inquiry or a, a, an investigation? Not an investigation. That's it's the like wrong a word. It's like a program that yeah, they're together, yeah. Yeah, that they are going to try and address some of these issues. But I do wonder if asking the people who have completely ignored these issues right up to now to address them in any meaningful way is is a little bit pointless. The inquiry found we've done nothing wrong. It'll be headed <laughs> up by Peter Walton, probably. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Yeah, he'd just be on the side. Well, no, the referees are are great. They're all different sizes. You can't say there isn't diversity. Some of them are fat. Some of them are thin. Some of them are bald. Some of them are bald. Some some are even balder than others. I mean, I don't know what more diversity you want from these guys. Okay, final one comes from Pete Ovens. And he says, I have enjoyed this season. 
Well, I can't comment on whether he's enjoyed this season. <laughs> I, pr- I presume it's whether I've enjoyed this yeah. season. I have enjoyed the hell out of it um, because it feels like Arsenal are, are maybe going somewhere and, and that ride's slightly bumpy. But the last couple of seasons, it's just felt meh. It, it's just mm. felt very meh and it doesn't this time. And the other thing I've, I've just loved being back in the stadium and being back in the stadium at a time like this, where there's a bit more, po- there's been a bit more positivity. Um, I, I've, I've enjoyed this season probably more than, I don't know, the last 10 or so. Um, like, uh, yeah, for, for all of those reasons, I, I really have enjoyed this season. I felt re-energized both by the team it's nice because I've been maybe an Arteta skeptic for quite a long time and I haven't liked being in that space. I liked Arteta as a player. Mm. I wanted him as manager and no one likes admitting they're wrong. Um, and I've kind of thought, ah, oh, maybe I was wrong about this. And and like, I, I still don't think that's decided, but I've really enjoyed the last couple of months going, oh, actually, no, I can see what he's trying to do now and I actually quite like it. And all that stuff that I was thinking, God, he's got to stop doing this. He's kind of stopped doing and um and yeah, I, I've I've really enjoyed it because for the first time in a while, I don't know where it's going, um, I don't know what its ceiling is, but it feels it feels exciting basically yeah. for, for the first time in a very long time. I think. No, I agree with you. I think there have been elements of the last number of years that have felt very much like a chore, and you're just trying to get through the games. And I know that we've still got a lot to do and a long way to go in terms of producing consistency, consistency of performances, uh, being a bit more thrilling, if you like. And maybe that's just an aesthetic view that I have. But but at the end of the day, football is about scoring goals. And the more you do that, the more exciting you are as a team. And, and that's something we've got to work on. It's something we've got to deal with at the moment, of course, because, you know, our striker situation is a, is a big thing. But uh, I feel looking at the team and looking at what's happening and looking at um, certain decisions that we're not trying to just stick a plaster over some of the problems. We're applying some stitches, we're waiting for the scars to heal, and then, you know, we're going to go out in the world and, and, and see what happens. So I've enjoyed it from that perspective, just from the point of view of, of whether the plan works or not, I can't say, but uh, you've a much better chance than just trying to make it up as you go along, you know? Yeah, and it's actually quite nice. Like, I can't emphasize enough, like, how surprised I was by last summer, by how how much better everything got in one window um, with, with those players that we bought. And it's really nice to look at the team and just, like, like literally this time last year, I was looking at the team and I was going... I don't even know where you start with this lot, yeah, quite yeah, yeah. frankly. And and it also shows you sometimes, do you remember that summer, like I know you've referenced it before, when we sold Henri and we bought Bakary Sanya and you think, what the hell are we doing? Yeah. And then it like it really improved. Like of all of the issues I saw this time last year, like I, I've, ne- I've never been massively high on Bern Leno. I've always thought, yeah, he's a good goalkeeper if you're between fifth and tenth in the league. Uh, and, and I still kind of think that, but I wasn't sitting here this time last year thinking, "Wow, well, God, he like he was very low on my list of people to yeah, replace." Yeah, yeah. And we did, and and I kind of thought with Ramsdale, really, okay, like, I'll, I'll see how this goes. And like, and and that's been an outstanding success. And it's really nice to look at the team now and think, okay, um, get the number nine signing right, please if we can get like a, a a more suitable left eight great and like the first 11 looks good it looks exciting and there's mm. room for growth there the squad needs thickening out like there are some players and and that will happen because a lot of those squad players have either been chucked out paid to leave or you know mm. respectfully Callum Chambers shaking your hand thank you very much but off you go El Nenny will go blah 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 so mm. you know how we replace some of those players but it's just really nice to look at the starting 11 and go yeah there's 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 two bits there yeah um and and then I think we quite look quite good and yeah. that's that's nice I agree and it's uh, I I like the players I like yeah. the players and I like things that they do even if they don't always do them perfectly and that is in stark contrast to some of the last few seasons when there have been players who I would quite happily just take out to the woods and leave there you know yeah so yeah. That, that even t- on that very basic level it is it feels better you know yeah yeah I mean to quote a song that was going up on um, the train on the way back from Villa away we like Tom Party we like we like Tom Party 
what wise words to finish off a podcast who doesn't like it just a put party? it out into the world that needs to go up at the emirates please all right listen we'll leave it there for now thank you for uh, going through these statements with us tim um and uh, just uh, before we go i guess uh, congratulations on playing your part uh, in the arsenal vision um fundraiser which went over a hundred thousand pounds this week the money is going to save the children it's going to an incredible cause and and it really does speak to what's truly uh exceptional and brilliant about the arsenal online community yeah 100 percent. just blown away by the generosity of people um to raise that amount of money in that short a time mm. is just like you say it's just a, it's it's a great way of um harnessing a community you've built just because you all happened at some point in your lives to support the same football team yeah um you know all of that money and all of the things that money is going to bring are going to make a huge, like a material difference to people's lives. And it's going to save lives Mm. and save children's lives. So like you cannot overemphasize the importance of that. So thanks to everyone that got involved and donated. Yeah, Bravo. Well done, everyone. And Tim, thanks a million. We'll catch you again soon. My pleasure as always. Thank you very much indeed to Tim. You can find him on Twitter at Stilberto, at Stilberto. He writes a column every Thursday on arsblog.com and, of course, covers Arsenal women over on Arsblog News, including the Arsenal Women Arscast, which I mentioned earlier in the show. That's available for you right now. And we've got another episode coming for you next week as well. Right. I think that's just about that uh, for this particular episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Remember, we will have a Premier League preview podcast for you over on Patreon tomorrow slash today. Tomorrow, as I'm recording on Thursday, today, Friday, when you're listening, we'll be talking about the game against Southampton. Uh, Myself and Lewis Ambrose will cover that over on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash arsebug. Remember, just to remind you that every single penny that is generated from our Patreon this month is going to UNICEF to help children all around the world who are impacted and so suffering because of war and conflict so we can provide them with medicine with shelter with health care with education and many other things besides so if you want to sign up for patreon you get access to everything all the content that's on there and has ever been on there and your money this month is going to go to an incredible cause so patreon.com forward slash arseblog and we will have a premier league preview podcast for you tomorrow afternoon right that's that for this one thank you very much as always james and i will be here on monday with an arsecast extra hopefully we're talking about an arsenal win because goddamn do we need one of those yes we do for now though have a great weekend oh it's easter as well isn't it? i completely forgotten about that so i uh, have many chocolates and easter things all that kind of stuff if that's what you're into have a very happy easter happy weekend james and i'll be here on monday and we will catch you on the next one until then cheers bye bye We've got Craig in marketing on the line, everybody. Yeah, hello, everyone. Great to talk to you. Lovely to see you. Hey, Steve, we're going to have some brewskis when I get back. Yeah, okay, look, I think obviously what's happened over the last few days has caused a bit of a brouhaha over the whole thing, but we can't let go of what makes it great in the first place, okay? We've got to hang on to those ideals and all it needs. I've been thinking about this while I've been here, is a very small, small, small change to the slogan. So I'm saying from now on, when the Arsenal players come out on the pitch, on the sleeve of the shirt, it just says, visit Rwanda, whether you want to or not.
Hello? Anyone?